Welcome to the fifth podcast from the Irish Roots Cafe. This is number five in a series of six podcasts on tracing your Irish ancestors. Only one more to go. Please be sure to send in your request for any special coverage we might be able to offer you in future podcasts. My email address is mike at irishroots.com and my webpage is at www.irishroots.com. Right now, I think I can hear Peter warming up in the living room, bringing on our next to last uh, podcast here. So I hope you enjoy it. Listen to these last two as long as you can. I'll talk to you later. Thanks. Bye. How off do my thoughts in their fancy take flight to the home of my childhood away? To the days when each patriot's vision seemed bright, ere I dreamed that those joys should decay. Where I sported and played, neath the green leafy shade, on the banks of my own lovely Thank you, Peter. In this session, we'll talk a little bit about immigration uh, from Ireland to America, and I guess we ought to start by defining the difference between between Irish and Scots-Irish. The Scots-Irish were mainly Presbyterian, and they came over in the 1700s, or at least that's the time period when they are recognized to have comprised the majority of immigration from Ireland to America. At that time, there were, of course, the regular Irish who came over too, but this time period, this century, is given to the Scots-Irish, whereas the 1800s is given to the Irish. Uh, The Scots-Irish were predominantly from Northern Ireland. Uh, They settled largely in Pennsylvania and settled throughout the Appalachian frontier. You'll also find quite a few on a regular basis, but perhaps not as large, in numbers in uh, the port of Charleston. It's been estimated that perhaps 200,000 in total came in the 1700s or or from, say, 1700 to 1775. Many were poor indentured servants, but still they were better off than the Irish who had arrived during the famine in the 1800s. The Scots-Irish brought with them the spinning wheel and potatoes and stills and made good use of maple syrup. They did, however, wish to distinguish themselves quite readily from the other Irish. It's not unlikely for you to read in the older books on history and immigration that the comment made by a Scots-Irish man would go something like this. It made my blood boil to hear ourselves called another parcel of Irish. And partially because of this, the term was coined Scots-Irish, and I believe it was coined in America more than any other place, and it was used to differentiate the Scots-Irish and their heritage from the Irish. The Scots-Irish were American frontiersmen. Perhaps they form the typical notion of what we know as the early frontiersmen in America, people like Daniel Boone. They were brought in and needed to repel Indians, and in South Carolina, for example, to keep the ratio of uh, the white population on a par with that of the uh, black plantation type situation. There was not always a warm welcome in in early New England for the Scots-Irish. And I guess you say when looking at settlements, uh, certainly a few arrived in the late 1690s, but by 1730 you you have what we might call a first great settlement in the the Cumberland Valley. Uh, The Irish Catholic, however, brings us to another period of time when they are recognized as coming in the 1800s. Now the prime time you'll find people referring to are the 1840s and 1850s. They, of course, came throughout the 1800s as well as in the 1700s, but certainly in very small numbers by comparison. Uh, The famine immigrants themselves, we might take a look at the famine in Ireland. Uh, There was a a blight on the potato crop in 1845. Another one followed perhaps a little less severe in 1846. 1847 is recognized as the height of the famine. Uh, The potato blight did not recede as it had done in the past. It continued to worsen. Therefore, people were starving. They were losing their lands, dying in the street, actually. Immigration on a a regular basis for for the Irish in the 1800s probably started around 1815, 1816, a little bit earlier, and uh, ran through the 1800s, certainly until 1860. Priest was seen as a leader and a mediator and a protector. This also served as a reason for the Irish to settle in the cities. They were drawn to the cities 
They are seen to be 80% urban in settlement, not necessarily because they could not farm or could not be successful as farmers, but something in, in their background drew them to the cities and to the people. Baltimore, New Orleans, Philadelphia, New York, and also Charleston remained as uh, ports of arrival for the Irish. They were in much poorer circumstances when they arrived in America, often merely living in, in uh, the poorest of conditions, and they are credited with establishing the first ghettos on a nationwide basis in the American cities. They were soon to move up from these ghettos, but it was quite a wretched existence in many cases. And you might want to know that in the 1800s, when you're looking back in the records, and you'll see a lot of Irish names, this may be because the Irish as a whole, people born in Ireland, were the largest foreign-born group in America from 1800 to 1850, particularly during the, the big famine times. The Irish came in and they were heavy, unskilled laborers. You'll find them doing the back-breaking, sometimes unskilled labor work, as well as working on the railroad. And you might note at this point that uh, I think it was around 1825 when the Erie Canal was finished, and that marks a point to look to the New York ports as ports of arrival for, from this date forward, New York would achieve a point of prominence in all uh, immigrations as far as point of arrival. Oh, another note on, on the groups that came in, you might be looking for some Quaker ancestors from Ireland. And their period of immigration was also very early, say from 1682 to 1750. And they're mainly of Eng English extraction. Uh, but if you're looking for those, primarily they did immigrate early as well as the Scots-Irish as far as recognized times of departure and arrival in America. Uh, Joe, did you have a comment on the Scots-Irish? Well, to me, when people have talk, spoken to me about being Scots Gaelic and they go on to explain what they mean by that, they're talking about that their ancestors were originally from Scotland, migrated to Ireland for a period of time, usually maybe even a couple of generations, and then eventually moved to America. And mm -hmm. then for that little intermediate stop, made them Scots Gaelic instead of just Gaelic. Mm -hmm. move on and look at some of the reasons for immigration. Just pass through it quickly. There was religious persecution for both the Irish and the Scots-Irish that brought them to America. There were famines not just in 1845 or 1847. 47, by the way, was the worst year of the famine. There were famines in the 30s. There were famines in the 1800s. I mean, 1700s. Many people lost their lands. Rents were raised excessively high. 90% of the land was Catholic in 1603 and it changed to just the reverse by 1778. Many lumber ships were headed toward America uh, with no, no cargo, so it was a welcome uh, boon to the uh, shippers to fill up an empty ship. And also, if you wanted to inherit land in Ireland at one point, there were 10 children in, in an Irish Catholic family, and one of them converted to the Church of Ireland. That one child would inherit all the land. So there were reasons for uh, Many people staying and some leaving. If you inherited the land, maybe the rest of your family would leave. We'll talk a little bit more in, in detail about the Scots-Irish. In the early 1700s, they founded settlements in New Hampshire and Maine. Prior to 1717, you won't find too many. Of course, there weren't too many here to begin with at that time. Uh, the first Presbyterian church in Pennsylvania, I think, was founded in 1692. Prior to 1718, they preferred New England, but that became inhospitable later. Mainly, they were from Ulster, as we said, and they would come to, to represent perhaps 10% of all Irish immigration into this country. On the average, I think you could say in these early times that maybe 4,000 per year left Ireland. Most of them came to America. They pushed over the Alleghenies into the Mississippi. Pennsylvania served at the, as the chief settlement and distribution center. Uh, they, they would move into Pennsylvania and spread from there. Uh, there was great freedom and liberty at that time. There was an economic potential for advancement, and there was a large number of ports along the Delaware, especially Philadelphia, where they could land at. Baltimore was a more popular port in the later colonial period, and you had large settlements, as I stated before, by 1730 in Chester, Lancaster, and Dauphin County. Lifestyle was, as I said, primarily a farming life on the frontier, hunting, trapping, uh, but they were not plantation or slave owners. The crossroads store, the tavern, and the church were the important meeting places, and they sort of served as a buffer to, to society by living in the frontier and pushing outward and doing battle with the elements and, and the Indians at times. The ports of arrival and departure may be of interest. Of course, most of the early ports of departure from Ireland were from uh, the northern 
half of the country. Belfast, Newry, Londonderry, Larne, and Port Rush were primary. Points of arrival included Philadelphia, the Luz on the De Delaware, and Charleston, South Carolina, which was a little more of a minor port, but it's fairly well recognized as receiving a continuous stream. Some did arrive at New York and Baltimore, uh, Norfolk, and other southern ports. Very few arrived at Boston or New England uh, after 1720, and the immigration was pretty steady from, say, 1725 to 1812. Okay, now we move into a whole different period, the second period, not the Scots-Irish, but the famine Irish period. We'll call it the 1800s. As we mentioned before, the ports of departure in the 1700s, uh, the early immigration, so to speak, were almost all in Ulster. You should also be aware, especially for the 1800s, of, of some ports in uh, the south of Ireland, including Dublin, Cork, Waterford, Galway, Limerick, Ford, and Sligo. Londonderry and Belfast, of course, remain ports of departure throughout the whole period. <laughs> ports of arrival uh, included Philadelphia and, of course, New York, Baltimore, Charleston, still, New Orleans, and Canada. Many, many Irish would uh, come to Canada or New Brunswick and work their way down into America after landing in Canada, which makes an interesting research project for those of you who think this might be a lead. The conditions during the time period, particularly of the famine, were terrible. Many say that the passengers were worse off than valuable slaves who were considered as property and could be economically damaged, uh, whereas just regular people traveling uh, were left to look after themselves. General destinations of Irish immigrants from 1845 to 1855 might prove of interest. Uh, some 70,000 have been estimated to have gone to Australia, some 340,000 to Canada, and many of whom traveled to America after that, and some say roughly one and a half million to America. When they arrived in America, they were urban, perhaps 80% urban, settling mainly in New York, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Massachusetts. Many later came to the frontier settling in towns like St. Louis, which held, I think, the largest foreign-born immigration population uh, around the middle of the 1800s. You'll note in papers that ads for Irish workers were uh, placed, seeking them, asking for them to come out west. Ads in newspapers like the Boston Pilot and Freeman's Journal were common. Soon after the Irish re reached their peak in, in immigration, the new German immigration after 1860 began to overshadow the Irish. Does anybody have any thoughts on uh, why the Irish came to America? What were the motivating factors? Joe, do you have any thoughts? Well, I know that some of my ancestors left um, for the true famine years. I I felt that most of them, what I can determine, probably were younger children in the family. And as you mentioned before, uh, the oldest child, usually the oldest male in the family, would have inherited the family land and left these, these particular siblings without anything. And they would have left to better themselves and to get farmland of their own by coming to the new world. I also have one ancestor who was a nice Irish Catholic boy in the north of Ireland who was conscripted into the English army. He deserted and came to America, so his reason for leaving was that I don't think he particularly wanted to leave Ireland or his family, but he definitely felt oppressed and came to get away. Mm -hmm. What about the uh, the Irish on the railroad? Everybody everybody realizes that the Irish played a large role in the railroad, and if you get some of the old railroad maps, you can tra trace the path of Irish immigration in America along the railroad routes, and they certainly did work them. Have you found any records relating to this, this type of work, the Irish on the railroad? Kevin, do you have? I believe it was the 1860 census in Wisconsin that uh, actually lists railroad gangs and bet that almost every one of them was an Irish. Yeah, I don't think a lot of work's been done to collate all this, the, the heritage of the Irish on the railroad. It'd be a fascinating thing to do. You have to realize also that the life on the railroad was all an itinerant life. You had very little opportunity to develop a family lifestyle, something that, that was held dear in Ireland. And it was for just this reason in St. Louis, where the Irish railroad working type bands, they, they decided under the leadership of a priest, Father Hogan, to set out and, and form a settlement now known as the Irish Wilderness. And it was probably maybe 40 families. 
The women, unfortunately, worked as maid servants in town, had very little time for any permanent social contact with, with the men, and they, they felt very badly about this. They wanted to, to strike out on their own, so they did, and they moved quite a distance away into the wilderness just to get back to, to a, a more rural way of life. But what about politics? What do you know about the Irish in, in the American cities once they've got here? The Irish, having lived so long under the oppression of English rule and Norman invaders and who knows what all, became very adept before they left Ireland at working within oppressive systems. So that by the time they came to America, they one of the reasons for clustering into the city is that they were very comfortable under the forms of government and working in large bodies. They were very adept at moving in and taking over and becoming well-placed in both political parties, in uh, professions such as policemen, firemen, councilmen. Um, they, don't, they didn't necessarily move to the forefront of the, of the popular mind, but if you look at the histories of cities, if you look at the history of your family, you often find them in these strategic places in the local government. Would you say that they knew how to operate within a democracy and they knew the power of the people and the power of a vote? Very much so. I think they, they were also very good as a people in organizing themselves. Labor unions is a good example. Mm -hmm. A lot of, of strong Irish labor unions. I think all the major fire departments and police uh, departments were dominated by uh, the Irish in, in the mid-1800s, and that's all across the uh, country. Ed? I will just have to, have to agree with that. They may have also taken advantage of their, their sheer numbers in uh, the bigger cities like New York and Boston. Yeah, I, I've read uh, old news, new pa newspaper clippings from the 1800s, and that goes from, from, the, from the Midwest here in Kansas City on back, uh, back east. But there'll be comments in there like, unless we rid ourselves of this plague, we shall never know freedom again. It says the Irishmen control the police department, the fire department, and the mayor's office as if they were breadcrumbs at their own tables. Unite, you Swedes, New War you know, Norwegians, and blah, blah, just unite everyone against this Irish plague because they were afraid of this new people that was coming in and taking over. And you can sort of look at it today and understand the fear that comes into the population when a new group moves in and has a lot of votes. Uh, luckily, things turned out okay, but there, there was some reason for concern at that time. Any other comments about the, uh, the arrival of the Irish in America, their routes or their lifestyle? Have you ever heard of the shanty Irish? Of course, you can, I know there's several definitions. I've always thought of it in my mind as the shanty Irish were the ones that came over with very little. They had they were working class families, probably didn't have a very good house, and they probably didn't have didn't have drapes for the window. Maybe I mean you're talking rough lifestyle. And when a person finally got good enough to put up a nice pair of maybe Irish lace curtains, that set them across apart from the whole social structure of the rest of the Irish, that is the famine Irish that came in and were struggling upwards. So I, I'm sure from the shanty Irish viewpoint, uh, say who was the first one in the neighborhood to put up a pair of lace curtains, it's like, well, who does she think she is? You know, lace curtain Irish? They had good connotations too. That means that they had made it up the social ladder, as most of the Irish eventually would. What else here? I'm sure there's some things of interest. One of the things I'll mention to people as they're researching for the family, I've already mentioned that if you're not sure how your relatives came to be where they were or where they might have gone if you've lost them and are looking for them, we've mentioned following the railroad lines as a pattern of migration. Um, I also think it's, it's helpful to study history of the country for the time that you're looking for the people. You'll find things such as when the Wild West was opening up, when Kansas was getting prepared to become a state before the Civil War, they would send notices back to Eastern Shore newspapers and say, you know, uh, Wagoneers, your future lies in Kansas, come and see us. You know, wanted 200 strong men to uh, take a mule team into Mexico, whatever. A lot of, of people then would leave the, the comfort of the city or maybe the squalor of the city and move western to the western states. And if you knew that as a historical fact, that might lead you to find some of the records that you're looking for. And that excuse me for another thought too, is that even before the Civil War, one of the ways that the Irish were able to make it in America was to join the military service. There were great many Irish on the rolls of uh, Indian fighters and the openers of the West. Yeah, a lot of the early forts, if you'll check the inhabitants of the forts, you'll find a lot of, a lot of Irish names on the frontier throughout the country. Uh, I remember uh, sometimes I, I've done research on Irish names of towns and cities, and I'll just tell a little story here. I found the name of O'Fallon, which is the name of a town, and I thought, oh, great, there's a story here. So I went back 
to, to the city hall and was trying to find the Irish roots of this town. As it turned out, O'Fallon was a German settlement, strange as it may seem. And here's the story behind it. The Irishman who decided the course of the railroad, so to speak, where it would go, his name was O'Fallon. And he decided to run his railroad through this town, this German immigrant town. Now, Judge Creekle, who was the a nice German important statured person in the town, I guess he had the final say-so, he struck an agreement with O'Fallon. He said, if you run your railroad through our town, we're going to name it in your honor, sir. And so this town of, of basically German heritage bore the name of O'Fallon as an honor to the person who brought the railroad to the town. So you can't always take things on uh, face value when it comes to immigration, but there's a lot of interesting stories out there, most of which have never been put into writing. Uh, do we have any other final comments on uh, immigration and distribution? Okay, there's a lot of good books out there on, on Irish immigration and settlement, uh, Scots-Irish as well. So for now, until the last session, which will be exactly how do you find all these records that we've uh, mentioned, I'll say goodbye for a few moments, have a good rest, and uh, when you're ready for this last one, turn us back on and be ready to spend a little bit of time thinking about what we're saying. Okay, thank you very much. wraps up podcast number five for the best of 1984 only one more to go hope you'll stick with us for that uh, just one more reminder i'm michael laughlin you can send your comments to me at mike at irishroots.com or browse my web page at www.irishroots.com thanks for dropping by <laughs>